good morning um, and welcome to a conversation on Big Cat Steward. It's such a pleasure and honor to have you as a part of the series. We share a joint passion for the cats of the world and it was strange the way we met. And then today we're doing this talk. Wonderful. And please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you are doing what you're doing today. Uh, well, I, look, I'm cat crazy, so I'll just confess straight away. <laughs> and my, my life's uh, work is to try and see all the world's wild cat species, all 41 at the moment uh, in the wild. I'm only on 25, so I, in my school report it said, should try harder. Well, clearly I, I still need to try harder. Um, but that's, that's my, really my source of passion and excitement is going into the wild and looking for these extraordinary animals. And this is a fascination I've had since I was a child. I always knew what I wanted to be. I said when I was five, I wanted to be a naturalist. And that's, that's what I followed ever since. And now that I'm working full time on tiger conservation rather than other jobs where it's always been part of the work, uh, I really am in heaven. Wonderful. I mean, it couldn't be better. I, I know the feeling exactly. And I think um, you know that I do that all the time as well. So um, please, please tell us about um, the Tigers Alive initiative and um, your work with WWF. Okay, certainly. Well, like I, I start with this picture. I, I just find it captivating um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, the composition's very good. The, the intensity of the, the tiger's eyes is also uh, hypnotic. Um, but it's also, it's a camera trap photo. Um, this is an image um, that a few years ago would not have been possible, but now with the advancement of technology, you can get these superb quality images of, of tigers. But the other reason that I love this picture is it represents the adaptability of tigers. This was taken in uh, neighboring, neighboring to where I'm based at the moment, neighboring Bhutan. And we know there that tigers can get up to 4,000 meters in elevation. Um, we can then swing further east and we know that tigers can survive in the Russian Far East at 30 below. And then we go south into the steamy tropics of Southeast Asia. And we know tigers are also surviving in th those diverse habitats. So really, wherever you look across the board, the story of tigers is one of adaptability. But despite that adaptability, it hasn't gone the tiger's way. Um, and there was a period up 10 years ago where tiger populations were in free fall. I mean, if we take that point, that lowest point, we uh, should be around 3,000 animals at that period of time. At that point in time, there were probably 20 to 30,000 lions. There may have been five to 7,000 snow leopards and over 100,000 jaguars. So of all the big cats, the tigers were in the most, the most trouble. And that, that big red line was, was heading in the wrong direction, was heading in a direction of, of a point of no return. But then something extraordinary happened. And that was in 2010 at the last Chinese year of the tiger. But there was a global summit to which six world leaders attended. And they did something extraordinary. First, they came together to talk about a single species, uh, which fortunately tigers. But the second thing they did was that they set a time-bound numbered goal for recovery. When, when does that ever happen? And they said, look, by the next year of the tiger, 2022, uh, we commit to trying to double, T times two, trying to double tiger population in the wild to over 6,000 animals. So here was this, this perfect sort of political moment for the species to say, okay, the world wants a double number of tigers, so how do we go about it? And what, what we know about tiger conservation is that they need large expanses of habitat. We need very large areas, and they truly are a, a landscape species. Um, and we also know that ideally, wherever you find tigers, we want them to be connected to 
to other areas in which they can, the population can disperse. Now, this example is taken from uh, Western Thailand and the, on the border with Myanmar. Um, the yellow animal, one, two, three, is all the same animal. Um, so if you follow that tiger, um, it started off in Hue Kao Kang, which is an area that's known for uh, breeding tigers. And then it moved. It moved into neighboring Maywong National Park and then up into Klonglang. You can take the black or the white tiger. So say the, the white tiger moved again from Hue Kao Kang, but then s stayed and actually bred in, in Maywong. So ideally, wherever you have tigers in the landscape, you want them to be able to be either connected, either directly, as in this case, between national parks or moving through corridors so they can, so they can disperse. What we also know is that tigers need adequate prey. They prefer a large bodied and not too difficult to kill animal, such as the samba deer in this sequence of photos. If you follow the time sequence, 106 a.m., 107 a.m., right on its heels um, was the tiger. And, and this, this sequence of photos also illustrates that as part of that sort of conservation formula for doubling tigers, we need good monitoring. We need to know where tigers are living. We need to know how many we have. And also, do we have adequate prey? And tigers, as well as being a landscape species, are a conservation dependent species. What I mean by that is that Tigers would probably survive in only one or two places on the planet without conservation. Maybe they would survive in a remote part of the Russian Far East or in an accessible part of the Sundarbans. Maybe they would persist for 10, 20 years. But if we want to double the number of tigers, we need to make sure that we have a suite of conservation interventions in order for them to survive, including well-managed and funded protected areas, including uh, a professionally trained ranger force. Um, there are just too many threats to tigers to, as can, to safely assume that without conservation they could survive. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we also know that for people living alongside tiger reserves, um, they have to be part of that uh, journey. They have to be part of the conservation interventions. Whether they are working directly for the National Park, um, whether they're engaged in uh, tourism um, or whether they're involved in uh, you know, lo local science projects or whether they're the beneficiary of conservation interventions that make it easier for these people to live alongside not just tigers but everything else that might come out of the forest um, and impact on their livelihood. So is Tea Times 2 possible? Has it been possible over the last 10 years? And so at a national level, as many of you will know, uh, last year, India came out with its latest tiger estimation. And there has been some critique of the methodology. But if we part that to one side, what is clear is that the overall trend is up. And certainly for sites where WWF uh, is working and we, we, we have the data, um, this overall story of, of this level of increase is one that is replicated in many of the parks in which we work. But this didn't happen by accident. This, this has happened because of a number of factors, but one of which has been that the government itself, uh, both at the state and the national level, has committed huge resources for tiger conservation. And this is clearly one of the parts of the recipe for tiger conservation and success. So, that's at a national level. Is tea times too possible at a site-based level? Now, the, the Tiger survey results for 2018 at a national level did not show that tigers are doubled. They're very close. Um, but if we take uh, some of these examples of parks, um, Bardia and, to, and the blue, uh, the blue column is 2008, uh, green column is 2018. So that's a represents a 10 year period. As you can see, 18 to, to 87, there's been a, a huge increase. And of course, this is partly through breeding, but also through um, dispersal from neighboring parks. Um, also, say, if you like Banke, uh, no tigers detected in 2008. Uh, but then look, in 2018, you have 21. Um, you can also see that in Chitwan, there has been a, a decline in tigers. But 
That's also linked to tides dispersing into neighboring Pasa National Park, which again has undergone a, a huge recovery. So at a site-based level, clearly there are interventions that are working and can lead to a recovery of, of, of tigers. If I step back then and say, well, how are they doing throughout the range? Um, as you can see from proof from this map, um, in the landscapes that WWF is, is working, so I'm, I'm sort of stepping away, if, if you like, from uh, government-based data. Um, in nine of the 13, and they represent landscapes from uh, India, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, up to the Russian-China border, in nine of 13 of these landscapes, tigers are either increasing or stable. Stable in the Sundarbans and uh, in that Thai-Myanmar border area that, that I was talking about before. But there's another story on this map, which is that in some places, tigers are decreasing. Um, and tigers are clearly not having it their own way. And so I'm going to now look at the reason for some of, for some of that decline. What we know for tigers in Southeast Asia is that you know, hot on the heels of, of tigers is man. And that's for a variety of reasons, but predominantly um, it's for hunting. And there's a snaring crisis in Southeast Asia where large volumes of snares are being set in, in the forest, very similar to, to this one, which I removed out of a park in um, Vietnam. They are uh, simple wire, wire cables. And we estimate that this is the reason for the extinction of the tiger in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. And Laos most recently, based on a paper that came out um, at the end of last year. So despite the government commitments to double number of tigers since, since 2010, in some countries, it's gone the other way, but to the worst possible scenario of extinction. Um, snares are, as you can see from this, uh, these pictures, completely indiscriminate. They're, they are cheap to buy, very easy to carry in large numbers, and by blanketing an area in a forest, it very, very readily captures most of the, the large mammal and small mammal fauna. Anything that has a gate that walks through the loop, if it's hanging from a tree, or in this case, or if it's a foot snail on the floor. Um, and this is emptying the forests of Southeast Asia. And in one of the, the protected areas that WF is working in Royal Bulum National Park, which is in the northern part of peninsular Malaysia, you can see that the number of tigers on the left of the screen declined dramatically over a very short period of time. Um, population halved, following that downward curve uh, and going the wrong way. At the same time, on the right-hand side, you can see that there was an increase in the level of, of snaring. So you could correlate the decline of the tiger and probably other large-bodied mammals with an increase in snaring. So what do you do when you look at this data? Well, as a conservation organization, you have to take action. This is not just for publication. Research for research sake is not conservation. Research that applies then to a conservation outcome is conservation research. And so what happened next was that WWF employed local community uh, patrol teams to go into the forest and just simply collect snares. Um, they, they were not, uh, didn't have the same powers as, as rangers, as government employed rangers. These were community patrols but they were extremely effective at removing um, snares. And just look at this data. Um, so the, snare, the active snare index dramatically declining in 2018. And by 2019, even though patrol effort had increased, we couldn't find snares uh, in 2019. Now, only time will tell if this intervention will then lead to tiger recovery. But certainly the major threat at this moment in time to tigers in Malaysia um, has been neutralized. But of course, this has to be a long-term endeavor. This is not uh, a one-off. And the tigers are you know, truly an Asian, Asian species, um, but they also 
live within a circle which has the majority of the world's population, you know, over three and a half billion people who live within this circle and all the world's tigers uh, live within this circle. So any future for tigers um, has to take into account the impacts of, of humanity on the natural world. And this is an infographic of there's a, the, complex, the complexity of, of tigers living within Asia. Um, yes, they live in and protect the dark green, they live in protected areas, they may have a buffer zone, um, but frequently, in order to disperse, in order to move from one area to another, they have to move through a man-dominated landscape, whether it's villages, whether it's agricultural areas, or they have to cross infrastructure, whether it's rail or road. And therefore, conservation interventions can't just purely focus on what happens inside protected area, which of course are critically important. We also have to address that the broader landscape level of interventions to ensure that tigers can, and everything else that uh, depends on tigers, uh, continue to survive. What we absolutely want to avoid is direct human conflict. Um, and there are a series of management interventions that can be done to avoid this scenario. Um, mapping hotspots, so the top left of the screen, looking at areas and um, in this national park in Bardia, at where hotspot um, mapping where the greatest number of incidents are happening and then use that data to target interventions. Do we need predator proof uh, pens? Do we need to create uh, uh, electric fencing? Is wildlife coming out to eat tasty crops? Therefore, is it an alternative? So there are a ho whole host of things that can be done to, to lessen um, the degree of conflict. And again, thinking back to that map, what about large scale infrastructure? Well, firstly, is the infrastructure going in the right place? Um, uh, but if that road, if that rail is gonna go ahead, what is it that conservation organizations can do to mitigate the damage to, to tigers and their habitat? Well, um, this, this research showed, uh, again, in Northern Malaysia, where is it the wildlife uh, is crossing? Um, and therefore, let's make that the area where either the overpass, the underpass, or in this case, the viaduct is built. And then what should it look like? I mean, what, sh what are the dimensions? Okay, so here are dimensions that would work, have worked in other scenarios, and then we monitor the use. So there are a series of things that can happen to, to help mitigate the potential impacts of, of large-scale infrastructure in the landscape. So is it possible in a, in a place where tiger numbers are increasing, if we follow that T times two dream, to, for tigers to live alongside people? So this is an example. Um, so if you take, again, the graphs on the left, we have an increasing human population uh, over a period of time. We also have an increasing tiger population, uh, as you can see, going up to almost 235 animals. So normally under that scenario, increasing number of tigers, increasing number of humans, you'd expect to see an increasing number of conflict. But if you look at the graph on the right, um, although there was a spike in 2012, um, there was then a gradual decline. And although there may be some data gaps in 2015, 2016, this is a story of declining conflict. So clearly it is possible increasing number of tigers and increasing number of people to live together. But again, it requires interventions to make that possible, some of which I've talked about in this presentation. So finally, 2022 is on our doorstep. Year of the Tiger and a summit that will be hosted again by the Russian government at the end of 2022, when the whole world is going to come together and it's going to talk tiger conservation. Now, we know two things. We know what needs to be done in order to continue the tiger recovery, because we know it can't stop now. It can't be a, a simple case of drug done. We, you know, we set, we've got through this 12 year commitment. Now let's get back to business as usual. Absolutely not. I mean, the lesson from Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam is if governments don't invest in tiger conservation, um, we're gonna lose them. So we know what we need to do, but also we know that 
having a vision and a target is important. That many governments have followed that initial vision. And even though as an overall effort, you might not reach the, the goal of 6,000 tigers and doubling, we know that in individual countries and individual sites, it's possible. So as we get closer to 2022, there's going to be a drumbeat. And we have to use this opportunity to make sure that tigers have a future beyond even the next year of the tiger, and that we can prove through conservation interventions that living with tigers is possible. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, you know that this is what I've been working on for the past 30 years now. So, um, and, and in these landscapes, India and Nepal, and I, I actually did some work with WWF Nepal. I did evaluations of some projects funded by the UN. So, yeah, this is absolutely what we're talking about. And just recently, in fact, I was talking to a friend of mine and uh, we were discussing the fact that some major highways are going through some critical tiger habitat here in India, near Ranthambore, you know, and, and it's actually so close to the park that it's a cause of concern. And they're, they're telling us that it's not going through the park, but it's going very close to the park and it's the Delhi-Mumbai highway. And there's huge pressure on at the moment to give the clearances for this project to get through. But uh, we're looking at, at the impacts and we're assessing what's going on. So it's, there's just so much happening and, and there's this huge thrust on development in the country. And it's something that we can't avoid because much of our population still doesn't have access to good roads and electricity and basic health care. So we know that this is happening. Excitingly, we're still discovering really great populations of tigers, for instance, in the Dibang Valley. That was a that was a incredible finding, but much of the Dibang Valley was under threat because of major hydroelectric projects being planned there. So it's just, it's this up and down where you're constantly getting good news and then bad news and good news and then bad news. And it one step, it's like a waltz with the government and you have to sort of figure out where you're going as you sort of dance your way down the path really. It's clumsy because we're not quite in sync as partners. So, you know, tell me about why Tigers Alive? Is that um, is because there were so many other big WWF projects and tell us about Tigers Alive and what is the focus of this that and how is this different from all of the other work that you have done? Right, and um, so I was just I was just reflecting on the, on your comment about this this increasing complexity of tiger conservation. It's it's now uh, a, a question of NGOs and governments engaging and looking at these these multi million in some case multi billion dollar projects in terms of working out what that balance is between development and and, and conservation. Um, I yeah the tigers alive. Uh, initiative started over 10 years ago and it was a WF's response to this the same catastrophic decline of tigers it's like as a as a network you also need to make it a priority you can't just point at others and say governments you need to make it a priority we have to do it ourselves and um, it's rather unique in the sense that as you know in conservation organizations uh, it's quite hard for a program to survive a three-year funding cycle no, no five-year so this is a 10 year funding cycle, but I think it, it shows that the network has got behind the idea of tea times two, that we know that conservation interventions are a long-term commitment. Um, and it's really been successful in, in keeping the focus on tigers through a series of different pro projects within, within the program. Um, but at the same time, we've kept the attention of the network in this cap down to 2022. Again, it would be an absolute mistake or folly that to arrive at 2022, the WF says, okay, done it, done Tigers. We got to as close as we could get. Uh, now what else do we focus on? We, tiger conservation is for, forever. Um, it's, it's something that's a, it's a, a lifetime commitment. And WWF also needs to continue that commitment beyond 2022. And of course we will. Um, but it's been... I joined this program just over a year ago. I'd been based in Southeast Asia for the last 15 years, working on 
a series of conservation projects, some of which included tigers. Um, but that experience in Southeast Asia uh, taught me that extinction can happen on our watch and that we as an NGO need to raise our voice on occasion when we say, look, a green line has been crossed. And even though we're in partnership with the government, there comes a point where we have to take a stance. And for me, that was on a couple of occasions on large scale hydropower on the Mekong River, where we looked at the, the spreadsheet and said, look, the number of people are going to be impacted, the livelihoods impacted by the loss of, of protein, fish protein, versus this hydropower dam, it just simply doesn't equate. So coming back to your uh, discussion around large infrastructure in some of these iconic areas, um, sometimes we can work for, for mitigation. Sometimes we can work to change where plans may be already set. But in some cases, if a green line is crossed, we just have to take a stance. Yeah, it's a really tough uh, call. What's also worrying me is the fact that a lot of the Indian scientists today have been talking about the fact that we've pretty much reached the carrying capacity um, for India for tigers. Maybe a little bit more, but not too much. And this is something that's been bothering me a lot because there are areas where tigers could be rewilded. Um, there are areas where we could introduce populations, but it's not easy to deal with local, you know, communities and explain to them that they're suddenly going to have a predator in their midst. And I think this is an area that I just haven't heard enough on from, you know, and I've been talking extensively, especially this last two weeks to people pretty much across the board. And we just haven't been talking about this. I mean, for instance, a case in point park next to Corbett in India called Rajaji. Western Rajaji doesn't have tigers and we really need to reintroduce a population there. And there's other parks as well where there is a prey base. It's already declared a protected area, but we need to reintroduce tigers. Now we have areas like Central India, uh, the Maharashtra belt, where there's been a huge increase in um, human wildlife conflicts to it. I don't know how aware you are of the daily ongoings of that. Um, and I've got data that I can share with you. For instance, last week in one day, we had 11 human kills. 11 human kills in one day, in 24 hours um, in, in tiger human conflict. And this is really, it's it's just, it's a huge problem and, and we're just not you know, looking at it correct. And it's also the other thing that I've noticed as a biologist studying tigers for so long is that tiger behavior is beginning to change when they're in island populations. There's a lot more tolerance, a lot less fighting. Um, yes, there have been fatalities when, when two predominant males have clashed and that will continue to happen. But by and large, they're becoming a little more social because resources are so constrained and especially in the summer months, you know, you have congregations of prey happening. I've not seen too much being talked about this and I just wonder whether that's the way forward and we need to explore more on how to deal with that. Also, in India, for instance, we have absolutely no insurances in place. So when crop damage happens due to prey coming in, uh, tiger prey coming in, then it's an issue. And, and people retaliate with, you know, putting out not only snakes, but in India, a huge threat is live electric wires. And we lose a lot of tigers to live electric wires. And of course, now you've heard of in Kerala, they put uh, homemade firecrackers in in. Uh, fruit and leave it around and to blow up wild boar. And um, I just wonder, I mean, what what do you what is WWF um, saying about all of this? What is the data you have on this? And what is the the general line of thought on dealing with these issues? Yeah, I mean, as, of course, as you've illustrated, there are some you know, really shocking examples of of what can go wrong um, when large predators come up, uh, up, up abut against large uh, populations human populations and um, and yes it requires a, a sort of suite of interventions 
uh, that are, are as complex as the situation we're facing. I mean, sometimes there's an ecological reason for that, that conflict. Uh, it may be a, a, a lack of prey uh, for the tiger due to hunting or due to the fact that the habitat's too small, or, and there could be an ecological fix. In some cases, it's a question of tigers dispersing into areas because they have been pushed out of their range and there is no prey and they can't move. And this is where we get the conflict with livestock and, and also tragically with people. Um, and again, there's a series of interventions that, that have to be tailored to each each situation. What, what we do know, um, and I've, this happened quite recently in Nepal, is that tigers are dispersing now from the lowland Terai. Uh, and for, for Nepal, it was a high altitude record. Tigers moved up to record at 2,500 meters. So we know that tigers are re-inhabiting range that they had previously. And that's, of course, bringing tigers uh, interacting with people who have grown up without them. Um, and that also requires uh, an approach that's, that makes sure that... Uh, so we often hear about e healthy ecosystems and the dependence of, of humanity on healthy ecosystems. But I often thought, well, what does that look like? What's the ultimate indicator of a healthy ecosystem? And for me, it's an area where carnivores, or the top predators or the top herbivores are still able to function normally within that area. And we, we've seen examples of where carnivores have been reintroduced to an area where there's been an absence for a number of years. And the, the cascade of impacts that it has. So when you're looking at healthy eco ecosystems, my view is a healthy ecosystem is a one in which you have those top predators, top herbivores, still able to exert their influence over that landscape. And I think that's part of the challenge of living with tigers or living with wolves or living with jaguars, uh, is that if we want these animals to have the influence that they were they form, we do need a series of conservation interventions to ensure that continues. And although tiger numbers are important, I think it's the tiger range, the area of tiger range that's the most important. If we can have an increasing area where even if it's a low number of tigers in a landscape, but they're able to exert their influence over the habitat in that area. That for me is the ultimate area of success. But as you just highlighted, it, it brings with it a whole suite of problems where tigers move into an area and people living there are either not adapted to that or don't know what to do in a certain situation. I think that's where government and NGOs play a very important role. Fantastic. Okay. So, Stuart, talking about other species that live under tigers, especially in, in uh, you know, the whole of, of Asia, there are the, the smaller cats, the middle cats and the lesser cats. And we have very little conversation about this. So, for instance, in India, we've been very worried about species like the caracal and you know things like the clouded leopard what have you come across in all these years of work in south and southeast asia about species like this what do we know about them what is happening with their populations well firstly there's very little dedicated research on, on some of these uh, fascinating species what i've also seen however and, and it's, it's the technical term is mesopredator release the where there may be an absence of the of large carnivals, such as tigers or leopards, that there can be, if the reasons for that, that decline isn't over hunting and over poaching, um, there can be then a, an increase in the number of these mid-level predators, whether it's a uh, jackal, uh, whether it's clouded leopard, uh, golden cat, et cetera. So I've been in parks in Thailand where tigers and leopards are absent, but they have very high densities of this, these, these middle-level, meso-level uh, predators, um, which they f fill a niche. And then on Borneo, of course, where there are no tigers, the, the top cat is uh, the Sunda clouded leopard. And observing those animals, um, they walk around like the top, top cat, like top predator. They, they have a strut that's similar to uh, leopards in Sri Lanka or tigers in India. When they walk along the road, they're, they're not bothered. They're, they're not looking over their shoulder for a predator to come along. Um, so, but there is there is a there is a hole in our in, in, um, 
uh, in our knowledge on, on these critically important and very hard to see uh, species. And I've spent many years, you just mentioned Caracal, I've been to the Greater Rand of Kutch, uh, uh, Little Rand of Kutch, on separate trips to look for Caracal and, and what was not successful, unfortunately. But I, I think in many cases, the reasons for large predator removal cascade down as well. And we also find that then these, these middle level carnivores are also missing as well because of those reasons, because of hunting or because of the major disruption in, in, in habitat. But I, I personally don't think there's enough attention on, on these extraordinary animals. Okay, wonderful. I mean, I think I, we could chat forever on all of this. Tell us a little bit about one of the really important things that WWF did, which was uh, the huge campaign in the 70s to actually stop, bring the world's attention to the plight of the tiger. And I think um, you repeated that when you, you did T times 2. But in what is the way forward? I mean, do you feel that we need to continue to go out there doing all of these exercises with the public? Or is it now equally important to target policy and decision makers at government levels only? What is the balance? How does this work? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I think we have to pull all the levers. Um, I think we're, we are living in a world where there is a disconnect between people and nature, that they're becoming more urbanized. And although there's a, so much more connectivity on phones and uh, you know 24-hour uh, cable channels, that, that relationship, that link to nature, however small, is important. I, I was raised in a suburban garden when I had to focus on ants and butterflies. Um, but that was my connection to nature. and. I could only dream of, 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 of other things. Um, but even that small connection is missing in, in, I think, in many people's lives. So I think but that, that connection, we, we have to do a better job at connecting people to nature and, and making nature accessible, whether it's accessible uh, in our own backyards or whether it's accessible um, in the national parks that so many countries are proud. Um, at the same time, um, we need to encourage governments not just to look at the, the GDP sheet because the GDP only spikes when nature is destroyed. When you cut down the forest, it makes a, an impact on your GDP. If it stays as it is, there is no impact on, on GDP. So we need to reframe that, what we look at, what we measure, and, and not always try and put a, an economic value on nature. I, I, I personally think that's a mistake. I think there's an aesthetic and ethical value of nature that we need to realize. Otherwise, we're going to continue to make decisions that are going to leave the next generation an impoverished planet. And for one, I believe they'll never forgive us. So one of the things that came across to me very strongly when I was doing this whole series, and one, it might be a role that WWF could play, is translating academic science into something that the average man can understand and having one place where everybody could access this information. A lot of the information is present in the form of technical papers in scientific journals and you can't log into those journals as a normal person. You need an academic subscription and it's often so high that you just do not have information. If there was a way to create a coalition and a platform where critical information about corridor connectivities, about uh, you know new advances in dealing with human wildlife conflict, policy change, uh, population growth, all of that could be put onto one place where people could actually access this. I think it would make a big difference because one of the problems that that comes out to me very strongly is this disconnect from nature that you talked about happens with the people who get elected into power into our governments and become the policy makers and right. that's the big connect and that's what we need to address so if information is available at one site across 
institutions across communities whether they're ngos whether they're academic institute whether it's an independent researcher if everybody who published everything on tigers could put it down in one place that would be one of the biggest things that would help in um, raising awareness and this would of course also cover films and documentaries and and video clips and and people could go in and if they saw something oh i saw a tiger on my doorstep this morning you know if that little clip could come on you would get in, in a lot of information of tigers moving across landscapes where potential conflicts could happen it would just be a really interesting way of doing things so i think maybe this is a thought that i could um you know end this conversation with because it's just um it's something that nobody's ever thought of yeah, i think it's a very good idea um you know i think that this sort of emergence of, of citizen science or now we can say citizen tiger and and has tried to make science and conservation accessible to all by uh, and not keeping it as the the exclusive refrain of, of science and academia but to say to anybody anything whether it's a clip from your iphone what time of day it is what was the animal doing we've seen an extraordinary growth in that kind of access to information through these sometimes very short but sometimes very impactful uh, videos or images that we we see i think yeah Have you seen that that little app called Blinkist on that's available for mobiles it summarizes a really important book into a really you know in a few pages so you can get the gist and the summary without having to read the whole book so if you had scientific studies and you had important findings the study could be there for people interested in it but a little summary of the key points that the common man could look at and then choose whether they wanted to go in further into it or not you know that would just be such a great thing i mean just imagine if you had an app on your phone which gave you information about what was happening to the tiger populations living in your backyard and you could also at the same time see what some scientist had studied sitting somewhere else in the world and said that approach works really well with the tigers in my area and you could then say can we try it in in our area and that would be a great push for this whole movement i think and we could um, you know different countries could do it in different languages and it would just be um, really really fantastic if this was possible yeah no i think that another you know great idea i purposely blocked you out when you said it summarizes a book reading books is one of my joys and and i think actually um you know books like six extinction by elizabeth colbert or half earth by e o wilson where they take years of academic research and they they make it into a readable but it's still a 2 300 page book um the app you described it sounds like it takes a 2 300 page book and turns it into 2 300 words um and again yeah, that's an important access point for for people who want to learn about conservation is uh, you know you don't have to go in at the deep end there are there are ways you can slowly get involved and and then decide whether and, you and when you read the six pages you decide how much it interests you and you know you want to go further into the subject and the link is there and then you can look at the paper or the book or whatever it is but it it also gives you the opportunity of knowing that all of this is there and you know what the great classics are we as ecologists and carnivore biologists know of all of that but the common person has not even heard of the greats um you know and no access to to this information so i think if we could do a compendium that would be just um the most amazing um next step for you know a lot of people in tiger conservation good idea I and mean, then that's a good note to end on i think I, I, <laughs> we need to collaborate and try harder yes absolutely wonderful stuart we'll be in touch and um let's hope we can go see some more cats together okay looking forward to it thanks very much thank you thank you bye, bye.
back in the 1970s, um, Tiger Tops had what was then the biggest and the first solar panel, uh, solar technology. <laughs>